welcome to this video where we'll be revising 1865 to 1890 so trying to put everything that we've done over the last few weeks into a cohesive and coherent message and story so the first thing I'm going to show you is this timeline with some major events by no means all of the events of the Gilded Age and the Reconstruction but these are most of them so we've got the presidencies of Lincoln ending in 65 with his assassination Johnson, Grant, Hayes, uh, Garfield shortly um, Chester Arthur followed by Cleveland and then Harrison and you can see the major events so you've got the 13th amendment the presidential reconstruction 14th 15th amendments Yellowstone etc etc what we've tried to do is group these in the next uh, slide into sort of significant themes so you can see we've got social changes and some of the key things that you should be able to identify and define and then say how they've changed society we've got the political acts so the disputed election the um, Boss Tweed being exposed and the end of the Tammany Hall whiskey ring. We've got the end of Reconstruction, Garfield's assassinated, um, and then the Populist Party beginning in 1890. We've got the economic impact, so you've got, you know, you can see the Gilded Age with population reaching a certain size, um, Standard Oil, uh, AFL being founded, and then the Sherman Antitrust. So all of these are the economic changes that occurred. So as I say, you should be able to define what these are. Now you can see in red are the Republicans, in blue are the Democrats, and Johnson is purple. Although he's a Democrat, he does run on the Union ticket of Lincoln during the war. So I've put him as purple to represent something slightly different, even though he is a Democrat. So you can see in this already, there's clear Republican dominance. You can see the impact of all of these events over time. So what is it that you need to revise? Now AQA give us these key points that everybody should be able to answer for each of the sections. How did government, political authority and parties change? How did the economy and society change? How did the role of the USA in world affairs change? How important were ideas and ideology? How united was the states? And how important were key individuals and groups? And that's what we'll be talking about, how they've changed from 1865 to 1890. Through images, you can see that in 1865, 1865, the United States is very different from what we recognize today. You can see the number of states, you can see the territories and disputed areas. Now by 1890, America itself changes significantly. You can see the purchase of Alaska, you can see the um, Colorado, Nebraska becoming, or the Dakotas as well, becoming states. And you've got the remaining territories, Wyoming, uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and the Indian Territory. And you'll see that by the end of the next period, the United States is fully formed. We've put the Kingdom of Hawaii on there because there's a trade deal, but they are not yet part of the states or linked to them in any way. Side by side, you can see just the extent to which the United States geogra uh, geography changed in this period. Railroads is now the second slide that we'll be looking at. So you can see in 1860, the extent of the railways, there was no transatlantic um, transcontinental railway. There's huge dominance of railway in the north, very few lines in the south, and that's one of the reasons why they win the Civil War, of course. By 1890, you can see just how far railroads have come. You've got four transcontinental railway lines running from east to west, west to east. You've got huge amounts of infrastructure around the north, some in the south, but nowhere near as much. And again, this is another reason why the north succeeds far more quickly in the Gilded Age than the south, than the east and the west. Population is, of course, our biggest indicator for you know, the United States changing. We saw that it became a country of 50 million. That's due to a natural high birth rate, as well as migration and immigration. So you can see large cities, New York, Chicago, etc., being set up and now containing more than a million individuals by 1890. So our first section, how did government, political authority and parties change and develop? Well, you need to start with the Civil War. You need to talk about the impact that that would have on the legacy of Lincoln. You're talking about the Reconstruction period, you know, president trying to force through it under Andrew Johnson, Congress battling back, and then you've got radical reconstruction with the Military Reconstruction Acts. Um, as a result of that, you've got the Republican schisms. Some felt that they went uh, too far some felt that they didn't go far enough radical republicans and you can mention thaddeus stevens in this you've got to talk about the 14th and 15th amendments and their impact on the republican party and the democrat party and you can say that you know this is a united states forcing through political changes so you can say that at this point political authority is um, quite high You've got the impact of freedmen, scalawags and carpetbaggers, you know, these names being thrown around and bandied about in the South. 
we've got the obvious Republican dominance in uh, elections of presidents, the Democrats in disarray until they organize themselves, and we've got the Democrat redeemers. That leads to the solid South, where the Southern states do not change into the Republicans for a significant amount of time. And then you've obviously got to talk about the Lily Whites and the Black and Tan factions within the Republican Party in the South. In 1876, we've got the disputed election, the Compromise of 1877. So you can see that the um, political authority, government and parties are significantly changing in this period. You know, the very fact that the, by 1876 the Democrats were in a position to contest an election is a significant change. Then you've got the Gilded Age. Does it deserve the reputation that it has? The period known as the Weak Presidents with Hayes, Grover Cleveland, Chester Arthur, etc. And the impact of political corruption. You can say that the politician's power was heavily undermined by the Whiskey Ring and the Tammany Hall incidents with Boss Tweed, etc. Uh, we've got the Mugwumps coming in that are standing by and political apathet apathetic and of course the rise of robber barons as an example of um, politi political authority being challenged and then by the end of the period we've obviously got the Sherman Antitrust Act that starts to come in to curb the power of the robber barons even if it is ineffective. Our second question, how does society change? You know, you're going to mention the African Americans, you're going to mention politics, north-south, women, urbanisation, immigration, westward expansion, labour, agriculture. Um, society changes significantly you know, because of the Reconstruction era, because of the um, 14th and 15th amendments. Uh, we've got the creation of the KKK. We've got the, re um, the reactions to that. We've got the lynchings. So you've obviously got the anti-KKK laws. And there's some positive changes to African-American lives with Booker Washington and other changes happening with middle class emergence, etc. In the South, we've got the Solid South, the Radical Republicans, the Redeemers. Um, things to talk about in urbanization, you've got immigration, mass immigration into the cities. That leads to a number of incidents. We've got the formation of places like Chinatown, Little Italy, etc. And the growth in nativism as a response to this. So by the end of the period, there is a growth of nativism against immigrants. And that leads to the Chinese Exclusion Act. You know, these people were brought over to build the railways. And when they became of little more use and because of the yellow peril and the yellow scare, they started to be um, discriminated against. All the time we've got westward expansion, the Oklahoma rush, the Wild West, the uh, impact of society and Native Americans. And of course, by 1890, we've got the growth in the labor movement. We've got Granger movement, the AFL, the Knights of Labor, the impact of the 73 crash. And then, of course, Robert Barron's and all of the responses to this. How does the economy change? America is an abundant uh, resource. We've got the gold mines. We've got the silver rush. We've got technological innovation in this period. We've got the growth of the Robert Barron's. You know, people like Rockefeller are now um, amounting huge uh, personal wealth. That leads to corporations, trusts, cartels. By the end of the period, people are fed up with the cor corruption. And so we've got the Sherman Antitrust, among other things. We've got the rise of organized labor. You've got the railway strikes in 77. Banking structures, you know, the response to the 1873 crash. Northern manufacture being the powerhouse of America, no longer agriculture. More people living in cities than in um, rural areas. And that leads, of course, to the decline in agriculture. In the south, cotton's still king, even by the end. But in the West, there is a significant decline in agriculture. It is no longer profitable to be a small, medium-sized farm. Um, you have to be part of the big business. USA in world affairs. It starts emerging from the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. It purchases um, Alaska. So that's expansionism. You've got the Dominican Republic and the, de the debate over that, whether it was to become part of... Um, America's sphere of influence, you know, it's annexation of the Midway Islands. Uh, we've got the events in Canada that's promoted by the Foreign Secretary Fish. We've got internationalism with the treaties in Berlin game uh, with China. We've got the treaties with other parts of the world. Um, and of course, the protection of the Monroe Doctrine with the incident in Mexico straight after the Civil War. Ideas and ideology were key to this period's significant change. Manifest destiny being the desire to westward expand. Expand. We've got the laissez-faire attitudes leading to the economic development. You know the expansion into the frontier, uh, the rise of robber barons, 
rugged individualism that one person can drag themselves up by their bootstraps and become incredible uh, millionaires just like Andrew Carnegie who was a Scottish immigrant who managed to rise to become one of the wealthiest men alive. Uh, isolationism is a key idea that drives the foreign policy as does the factions that believe in expansionism that America's manifest destiny is to have an overseas empire. Social Darwinism plays a part in how white people see African Americans as well as explaining some of the success of Robert Barron. So you can see that ideas and ideologies are key to America's prosperity in this period. How united was the USA during this period? Not very is probably the best answer. So you've got black versus white. You've got Reconstruction, the Military, Military Reconstruction Act and the response to that. You know, by the 76 election, just three states are no longer redeemed. North v. South, carpetbackers, scallywags, East v. West, rich versus poor with the 77 strikes and the response to the political corruption. We've got men versus women starting off in this period. Republican versus Democrats, so you can talk about the redeemers in this period. We've got Republican versus Republicans, you know, the half-breeds, the stalwarts, the radicals. All of these show that the United States was not united with politics, um, let alone anywhere else in society. Um, in foreign policy, there is a group of expansionists that try and campaign against the isolationists. You can include the reaction to the Dominican Republic, where Grant tries to force through... Um, the Dominican Republic becoming part of uh, an overseas colony and then it being to turn, turned down by Congress. And of course we've got the progressivists versus the corruption. So by 1890 there are 23 states I believe that have now passed anti-corruption laws to try and break up the power of the cartels and the trusts and they get turned again. Uh, and then, then so we can see this, the growth in the progressive movement. How important were key individuals? There are so many that we can talk about. You need to know about Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, the presidents, weak presidents, etc. Individuals such as Stanton, you know, that caused the downfall of Johnson. We could talk about the McKinley Act. We can talk about Roscoe Conklin in terms of political corruption, in terms of uh, the spoil system. Sorry, we've got society individuals such as Booker Washington. In the robber barons, you could talk about Vanderbilt, Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan. All of these are key individuals um, that demonstrate things in American society. Corruption, Boss Tweed, William Boss Tweed. We've got foreign policy, the foreign policy secretaries of Seward, followed by Fish. All of these individuals play a key part in America's growth and developments. You know, you can contrast that with, you know, the growth in the economy, the growth in foreign policy, etc. But these individuals play a key part in everything. Thank you very much.